Okay, welcome to another RDWorks Learning Lab. In fact, this is part two of the work that we're doing on 3D engraving. I've imported our modified bitmap file into RDWorks. There are several things that I've got to consider before we get this programmed. The first thing we need to do is go up here and look in the bitmap handle and we start to look at the properties of this. Now it tells me that the resolution is 343 pixels per inch. The problem with that is response time. From previous work that I've been doing it takes about a millisecond for a pixel to be resolved and we've already decided that from our test results that 200 millimeters per second is the speed that we need. So what we've got to do, we've got to work backwards and say, well, if we're going to run this thing at 200 millimeters a second, what's the resolution of the picture that will give us one millisecond per pixel? It might sound complicated, but it isn't. In fact, I'll show you how you can do it. So we've already decided that the speed is going to be 200 millimeters a second. And so what we can do is we can take one second and we can divide that one second into 200 pieces. Now that tells us the time it takes to travel a millimetre and it happens to be 0 0.005 seconds. That's five thousandths of a second. In other words, it's five milliseconds. Now we know that we are limited to roughly one millisecond for each pixel from previous work that I've done. A millisecond is a guide. It isn't an absolute. But we'll use that as a starting point and we'll then say that that means if we've got five milliseconds to play with and it takes one millisecond for a pixel to form, we can actually allow as many as five pixels to occur in one millimetre. And 25.4 millimetres is the number of millimetres in one inch. What we're really doing is converting that five pixels per millimetre into 127 pixels per inch, which is the standard representation of resolution. Now 127 pixels per inch is the ideal. We could probably go up as high as 150 pixels per inch without causing any problems. But I don't know whether it's going to make a great deal of difference to the quality of the picture. So let's just have a quick look, should we? So if I put a, if I put a handle around that, so I'm going to set the picture size to start with. I'm going to keep the aspect ratio the same and I'm going to set this picture. It says it's 61 there. Let's make the picture just a shade bigger, shall we? We'll make it uh, 70. So that's 70 millimetres wide. And now we'll check what we've done to the resolution. It was 3 for 340 something, wasn't it? And it's now 302. So making the picture bigger has taken the picture resolution down. So what we can do, we can come into here now and we can we don't want to dither it, we want to leave it exactly the same, but what we do want to do is to change the output resolution. At the moment it says it's 302, we'll take it down to 127, which is the theoretically best value. So we'll apply that to the view and see what happens to the view. Not a great deal in there. We'll apply it to the source, which is this picture on screen, and we'll click can't see any difference. So we've set the resolution now. What we've got to do is go to the bitmap itself and look at the parameters that we're going to use in there. Is output? Yes. Speed? Well we've already determined that's going to be 200 millimeters a second. If blowing? Well on my machine I've got automatic control of that and I'm going to say no, I'm going to switch it off. Scanning? Yes. And now we've got these settings here. Well, we've decided that we can go as low as 10% because that's what my calibration graph is all about. And we went as high as 68%, which is the maximum for the machine. I don't need to do much here other than put output direct. Now, output direct is very important because that is the thing that gives us grayscale engraving and allows interpretation of 256 levels between 10 and 68% power. OK, now we've got to set the interval. Now, when we're doing dot graphics, the interval is very important that it matches the pixel resolution. That is not the case when we're doing scanning. So what we're more interested in now is that the scan lines touch each other, but don't really overlap. 
If you overlap them, we should get double burning and a strange coloration. If we leave them too far apart, we should get gaps between the lines and that will be just as troublesome. Let's try 0.12, should we? Although when we did our tests, our tests were done at 0.15, so therefore I will reset that to 0.15 millimeters because that's they were the parameters that we used for our test square. Bear in mind, we are going to have to run this program five, six, eight, ten times to get any depth into the program. So we don't want to be standing by the machine while we run once and then program it yet again. Now there is no such thing as repeat mode, I don't think, on this machine. So what I'm going to do, control copy, control V, control V, Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We'll run it nine times, the program. Yeah, but that doesn't run the program nine times. No, I know it doesn't. But we can make it run the program nine times by doing this. We can put that one on a blue layer. So that one is output, yes. 200 is blowing, no. Processing mode, scan, power, 10, 65, We don't have a second head. We do want output direct. And I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to do something a bit different. We've got intervals here set to 0.15. Instead of X swing, I'm going to choose this as Y swing. I'm going to move this up and down for the second pass rather than across. Now, I think I'm going to do that all the way down these. OK, well, that's that tedious job done. Now, where do we go from here to make sure that all these work one after the other? Well, it's a simple task, really, because all we're going to do is we're going to put a box around the whole lot. And then we're going to come up here and we're going to organise these into, first of all, centre vertical. And then we're going to centre horizontal. And there we go. They've all disappeared into one, one behind the other. move them as a group now and if you don't believe me we can come up here it's a big program and we can do a simulation and then as soon as that's finished you'll see something traveling from left to right or right to left instead of up and down there we go so that's proven that we've got more than one layer there and that they're working in X and Y swing. Now I'm now going to save that file to a memory stick, which is going to be a large file, and then we'll go out onto the machine and run it. Right now, while we're waiting for the, uh, the machine to load, um, which is going to take probably another 10 or 15 minutes, um, this was a piece of tulip wood, which is very soft wood, that um, I tried to do this same eagle on um, probably a month or two ago and you can see how badly it's burnt up. Now, <laughs> in fact it's quite disgusting but of course we can see from that that I was basically trying to do that in one cut and it's really really not successful. What I've done for the future I've tried to make this test pattern much much simpler so what I've done, I've generated a little test pattern like that, which basically is 10%, 65%, in other words, minimum and maximum, and then 100 to 400 millimeters a second. So in those 12 squares there, you can see the range of color that you're going to get from any particular lens. So you can swap your lenses over and do three of these and then make a decision about which speed and setting you want to use. Now we can clearly see that although I'm using 200 and a two and a half inch lens for the MDF, that would not be suitable for this particular wood. 
This particular wood looks as though it requires 400 millimetres a second. It might get away with 300, but the coloration here is pretty good. I've got probably best part of half a mil cut still, and that's with the fastest speed, maximum power, and the softest lens. So what I'm really saying is whenever you do this 3D engraving, you'll need to run a test pattern on your particular wood that you're going to be using because every wood is different. Well, the cutter's coming out a little bit deeper than I expected. Looks closer to half a mil rather than 0.1. You'll note the white light during cutting. I'm sure you'll never ignore that again. And the other thing I have to observe is I'm looking very closely at the job. I cannot see any curtains on this job at all. Well, undoubtedly the result is a bit brown, but it's not it's not scorched. It's not actually um, leaving any carbon behind that I can see. Now I'm going to close the lid. I need a bit more directed airflow through there. So I hope you can see how important it is to have a cross flow of air <clears throat> because it pulls all the fumes away without blowing them down back onto the job. Well I have to say that I can't see any obvious colour difference between layer 1 and layer 2. That's good news because it means there's no cumulative burning effect. Well I'm going to stop this <clears throat> after this pass. Well, it's not burnt, which is really quite good news. There's no obvious vertical lines in it at all, but it looks a bit like sand, <laughs> a sand casting. It's actually not very good at all, but I think that's probably mainly down to the material itself. Now, we could try my tulip wood. I've also got some white maple somewhere. My favourite material of all time. A piece of acrylic. Now, I still think we ought to do the test on the acrylic to find out whether or not we've got a problem. And again, I think that probably I'm going to have to be, I'm going to be stuck with using a two and a half inch lens. Now the problem with acrylic is if you cut it too hard, you get a really get a ploughed field in the bottom of your cut. So what we're trying to do is to try and find some settings which leaves the acrylic clean at all stages. But we should see that when we've carried out this test. Everything is pretty good except that one. And I'm wondering whether I've left my air assist on for that one little square there. So I shall have to go and check my program. Well, yes, I've been to check my program and I did leave air assist on. And you can clearly see just the effect that having the air assist on makes. So I modified the program, we'll run the test again. So I can see melting in the bottom of that second cut there. And I can definitely see melting in the bottom of that third cut as it's taking place. Well, it's, I have to say it's very tempting to go with those because despite the fact that they are, they're definitely melting in the bottom there. Strange enough, I think probably 200 would be the choice that I would make. And that's what we have set in the machine at the moment. So <clears throat> perhaps we'll just go for it. this fifth pass and open up the lid and I'll show you what I'm going to do. Now over here I've got my 
block of material, I'm going to drop the table down about 10 mil, like that, for the last pass. Now hopefully by putting the beam well out of focus, I shan't actually do much cutting. What I should do is more surface melting and effectively polish the surface. Let's see how successful that is, shall we? Very slight ripples in this and both horizontal and vertical curtains. But to be honest, I'm not sure they would show if it was wood. It's only because we can see through it and get all sorts of slight imperfections showing up. That's pretty impressive. I've never seen these, um, these grapes down here before. And I would say that it's possible that maybe if I just change the profile of the tube, because I'm not so sure that linearizing the power is absolutely the best way to do it. I think probably this is a little bit on the light side. Not bad. I think I could probably just tweak the profile a little bit to bring a little bit more definition out on these light pieces. In other words, if I make the lights just a little bit darker so that I get more more resolution on here, but this is still pretty damn good. Let's do my test on a piece of maple, shall we? I've definitely a two and a half inch lens convert when it comes to 3D engraving. Looking at those, I would say 300 is good. I would say the right settings will be 300, which means I've got to go away and modify the program to change all the settings to the 300 millimeters a second. Right, this is uh, maple. Oh, that's quite nice. That's hardly burning at all on maximum. Leave that to run for a little while. Now, in maple, it's not bad, but it's... First of all, it hasn't got any sign of curtains. Um, <clears throat> but it, it's still got a slightly, what can I say, sort of sandy effect on the surface. It isn't a very smooth effect. I'm fairly confident by changing the parameters on the calibration graph we'll be able to get more definition on these bits. But it's got a rough finish at the moment, which I'm a little bit... I'm going to see if I can do something to fix that. Obviously the good news is, look, it's hardly coloured the wood at all. Now it doesn't say that my theory about burning and taking the carbon off is correct, but um, it doesn't really matter whether it's right or wrong. We've come to a conclusion, which is good news. Well, that was attempt number one, and I decided to have a go with a few different parameters. And here is attempt number two. Now that is quite amazing. Hardly any burning. Just a little bit of discoloration around here, which I think is no more than sort of reflected fumes off the side. Um, it's really quite nice. We haven't got any of this 
sandy texture that we had on this one. Just the merest hint of it. And how have I achieved that? Look at the definition on... Compare the definition here. They're the same number of cuts, basically. I did six cuts on here and six cuts on there. I very slightly modified the calibration and look I've pulled out a lot more definition on these parts here by just adjusting the calibration car graph very very slightly. No hint of curtains. Let's just change the angle and the light. Look at the definition on these grapes here. That is quite phenomenal isn't it? The detail on the wings. Go and have a look at the background. No hint of any curtains that we can see there. And the only brown is literally, as I said, it's the, uh, it's the resin that's in the air. I think we've nearly cracked it. The only thing I've got to do is tell you what I did here. <laughs> Mind you, it could be my secret. I would say that that's almost good enough quality to manufacture decorations for woodwork. I'm very impressed with this piece of maple. Now what I'm going to do is to try exactly the same settings on acrylic. I mean, look, just from here, you can see the crispness of the one on the right as opposed to the one on the left. This is relatively speaking a hardwood. I'm going to try it on the softwood as well which is the um, that tulip wood and see what sort of results we get on there in a minute but before I do that I'm keen to get back onto um, acrylic. Well I thought the other one was pretty good. I have to say that this is actually phenomenal. this one it's turned it almost into glass. I mean that pattern is about six millimeters deep after six cuts and a flame polish. Again we've got some of these uh, crisscross shapes in the background but actually they, they don't look too bad they look quite attractive on this particular instance well I thought that one polished up quite nicely but this one is exceptional look well I feel fairly confident I've cracked 3D engraving now um, you can't do it on softwood, I can tell you that for a fact. If you look carefully you'll see that the grain has actually taken over and there was no way that I would be able to complete this job because the grain was just too, too coarse. It's a bit like waves in the sand as I put my hand across there. If I hold it to the light you can see the steps in the wood. Now actually in black it doesn't come out all that clearly but uh, I suspect this would come out extremely well in a hard wood. Well now that I've washed these two images up and I've done nothing more than wash them under um, warm water with a scrubbing brush just to remove the um, all the debris that was around the brown debris. Now it's quite amazing the final quality that we've got in this one. Now we will go back to Photoshop and I will explain through you step by step how I've moved from this to this. Before we do that, I think I've got to make a bit of an admission. When I was doing my dotting work, we were definitely looking to be able to see the amount of time that it took for an individual pixel or an individual dot to form. When I was investigating the signals that was happening during this sort of 3D engraving, 
we were seeing that we had the, um, the, the beam switching on and over that period of time the current was actually jumping up and down and I'm grossly exaggerating this with steps as the current was moving up and down to produce an engraving it was doing this the faster the speed that I ran the less definite these steps were and I limited myself to about one millisecond where I could just about see a bit of a ripple like that in the steps between pixels now I think that I was blinded by my dotting experience and I think that I was looking at this whole problem the wrong way if we run faster or with a finer resolution what we should do we should finish up with this a smooth shape gradual transition from one power to another and I think that all the rules that we started this session off with i.e. one pixel equals one millisecond is total crap the one thing that we've learned is you cannot rush 3D engraving the little test square is essential I think what you've got to do is establish that you do not get huge variation in burn colour so that's the essence of the change of mind that I've had as I've been watching this thing working and that these may be these grains of sand that I can feel on here are in fact almost like individual pixels standing out and that's why it feels so rough so here I've got another piece of maple um, and I've attempted another drawing using the new principles and it's come out fairly well it's a little bit darker the wood has burnt a little bit more for some reason or other but that could well be just the wood itself so what I'll do I'll take that in and we'll give that a bit of a brush and clean and we'll see what sort of results we get from there now let's follow the steps that I went through to achieve those rather interesting and good results the first thing I did was to go back to the main uh, photograph and if we take a look at the image we'll see that it was uh, 343 pixels per inch now we reduced that to 127 for our first attempt because that's what the one millisecond rule asked for well let's throw that rule out the window and let's leave this picture at the resolution that it is so we have to go through two steps if you remember the first step is adjustments levels and we have to take off some of the white pixels that are here now if we take that down to 250 say if we take a look at the preview I switch the preview on and off you can see very gently as I switch on and off how it's going very slightly whiter and darker okay that's a very very minimal difference in the picture I've just made sure that we can never get any true white in the picture next step image adjustments curves I'm going to load in my original China blue and there it is and you can see how white the image is gone now if we tinker with this just a little bit and take it back to more straight whoops don't want to do that if we just lift some of these up just a little bit you can see how we're bringing back some of the definition into the white area now I've probably gone a little bit too far there take it down a shade 
So now we've definitely got a little bit more clarity in those bright white sections, but we're still uh, correcting for the nonlinear power, but maybe not quite as much. So we say OK, and we'll save that. And that now becomes our, if you like, our master calibration for the machine. So we've imported our new picture into RDWorks and we'll just check with the bitmap handle and sure enough, 343 pixels per inch. So this is the same picture that we, uh, we've just sent from Photoshop. We don't need to do anything with this this time. But what we do need to do is to go up here to the parameters and the first thing we're going to do is to make sure we run as fast as we can, 400 millimeters a second. Um, we're not blowing, we're doing a scan. We've got our 10 and our 68% power and we've got our output direct selected. Now we're going to do again, because we've got a much finer, higher resolution picture here, we're going to produce a bigger file and I'm going to make it even bigger because what I'm going to do is to change this interval down to half that 0 0.075 millimeters. So I'm going to put twice as many lines. Now all this data, pixel by pixel, line by line, has to be sent down as a code to the machine. So this is going to be a very large file. Now there is a file size limitation as to what your machine will take. So if you get a file rejected, you'll know why. And then this time, because it's a big file, and again, I don't really want to keep messing around with the machine. I'm going to produce a copy of this. There we go. So we've now created a blue layer with that one on it. And this time we'll set the blue layer. 400 millimeters a second. Yes. Blowing. No. Scan. Yes. 10. 68. Yes. Uh, output if direct. Yes. And this time we're going to set it to Y swing. So now I've got a pair of files that are going to run. 1x, 1y, and again I've set the internal, sorry, I've set the interval to 0 0.075. So we've now got two big files that we're going to load down to the machine. Okay, now in anticipation, I have already processed this file, which you've seen once before. Let's just check with the bitmap handle, and we shall find that it's already at 300 resolution. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to set the output resolution here this time to 600 pixels per inch. Apply to view, apply to source, OK. So now we're really going to push the boundaries because I've got this feeling that my sandy graininess will get even better with a higher resolution. This is our black layer and we do the same with this as we always do. We set 400 no blowing, scan, 1068, output direct, X swing, 0 0.075. So we're happy with that. And we'll set that onto a blue layer. And we'll set the blue layer up again as 400, no blowing, scan, 1068, output direct. And this time it's Y swing with the same interval, 0 0.075 millimeters. And at 600 pixels per inch, we have probably doubled the file size. So whether or not when we put these together and try and get them down into the machine, it will work, I can't say. If the worst comes to the worst, what we shall have to do is to generate one program for X-Swing and one program for Y-Swing. And I shall have to alternate the programs. Inconvenient but at least it allows me to get a much bigger, finer resolution picture into the machine. So the main thing is with both of these, and these are both done at same sort of speeds with the same wood. Wood has got its own characteristic and there are no, piece, no two pieces the same. The only difference is that this has not been cleaned yet. And if we look here, you'll see how even the browning is between the dark background, which should be black, and the light foreground, which should be white. The burn is actually really nice and even, and that's what we're trying to achieve. And you cannot achieve that with too much power. Okay, so now we're in a position to compare 300 dots per inch 
and 600 dots per inch. Now this is a pretty fierce and demanding test because we're in seriously strong bright sunlight. And there we go, look at the feathers on the wings there and we've got this very fine texture on there which is basically I think almost the scan lines by the look of it. But they're intersecting with scan lines from the other direction. So let's take a look at exactly the same thing on the 600 dot per inch pattern. We've got vertical lines on there, but those vertical lines are actually not vertical if you look carefully. You'll see that that is actually the grain structure of the wood. Now this one scrubbed up, but it's still dark. This one scrubbed up, and it's virtually back to natural wood colour. It wasn't bad to start with, but it has scrubbed up to virtually the same colour as the base wood. So we've done virtually no burning on that at all, which is absolutely fantastic because we've carved the wood away without leaving any carbon deposit or any marking behind. I think my principle of removing wood and carbon at the same time is probably credible. I wouldn't say it's absolute, but it's credible. To be honest, we don't really care what the explanation is now that we've got to a solution. That possible explanation was a step to getting us where we are. Well, here we are at the end of, I think the end, of a very long and tortuous road. It's probably been about 18 months that I've been playing on and off with 3D engraving. And at last, I think I can say, I understand it and I know what I'm doing and I should be able to produce some reasonably good quality product out of this machine provided I use the right materials and that's the key thing you can't use softwood you've got to use a hard grainless wood something that cuts really nice and smoothly the only unanswered question at the moment is my grainy MDF now if I throw 600 dots per inch at that Will it get better? You can find out by doing it yourself. <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks for your time and we look forward to another discovery adventure in another session. Bye now.